Right, well, my Eurostar leaves at 7, so um, I'm going to start talking now. Um, my name is Leif Lindholm. I am employed by ARM, but I work full-time seconded into the Linar organization. Um, this is not a bash fest talk. I'm not here to try and convince everyone that UEFI is the future and everyone have to adore it. Uh, it is entirely about trying to actually how should we say, dispel some misconceptions some people have and make sure that those people who still hate UEFI after this talk at least hate it for the right reasons. <laughs> oh, and about the dogs. I first did this at the mini DebConf in Cambridge in November and they all had cats all over the place. I figured I'd, I'd put my dog on there. <laughs> so, UEFI's kind of accumulated a bit of a bad name in the open source and free software community in the last year or so. And this presentation is all about trying to set the record straight about what problems there actually are out there, how they relate to the actual thing that is actually UEFI, uh, both with regards to specification and the actual code base, uh, and hopefully dispel some misunderstandings. So I kind of wrote this originally because I'd started hearing people refer to things that in the past would just have been shrugged off as meh, a BIOS bug, as this is an evil plan with UEFI Secure Boot to lock down our computers so that we will no longer be able to run Linux, um, when they actually ended up being stupid BIOS bugs just in UEFI. So, um, as I said, I need to start by attempting to explain how UEFI is not this evil plot. Um, and even if you have made your mind up that the concept of binary signing is evil because you can use that to lock down a device, um, I at least want to make sure that everyone understands which bits you actually should be objecting to. <coughs> um, so I start with kind of a quick intro in decreasing level of nefariousness of the different um, issues surrounding UEFI. Um, and Again, I, I tend to hear people bundle together everything that has anything to do with UEFI as UEFI. So I try to go through them um, one by one. So we have some issues with the Microsoft logo requirements for Windows 8. That's really the bigger problem. Um, there's UEFI Secure Boot, which you may or may not object to depending on your attitude to such things. There's UEFI, which you may or may not object to, depending on how you view things. And then there's the shim, which you may or may not object to, depending on how you view things. And a slide I added since the Debian presentation, because this has become a bit heated in the ARM community, if nothing else. Uh, UEFI is not a CPI. You can use UEFI to facilitate getting ACPI information into the operating system. You can also use it to facilitate getting device tree information into the operating system. The fact that ACPI has now moved under UEFI governance in no way changes this. In no way changes this. <laughs> so, the Microsoft logo requirements was an interesting bit of thing that came out as part of the Windows 8 launch. The Microsoft wrote down some rules about how the firmware on any devices that ship with Windows pre-installed must operate. Um, part of this was that it has to be able to cryptography verify the signature of any image it loads uh, using the UEFI secure boot protocol. For x86 devices, the document explicitly said that the user must be able to disable this um, verification step if they wanted to. Um, for Windows RT, also known as ARM devices, uh, the document explicitly says that the signature checking must not be possible to disable. Did I mention I work for ARM? I don't necessarily approve of this discrepancy. Um, from Microsoft's point of view though, I do sort of, yes, they're evil and everything, but I do believe it's more about them not even considering the possibility that someone would take a mobile device and run their own operating system on it. But, yeah. 
the obvious issues here were made slightly worse even by the fact that the implementation details of the UEFI out there and shortcomings of the UEFI specification before UEFI version 2.4, which was only updated last summer, uh, mandated that you could only have one key to verify against, which meant that all OS installers must be able to be signed against the same key. And Microsoft, of course, for all intents and purposes, even though it's technically not that, Microsoft are their own CA for the Windows installers. Hence, anyone who wants to install software on anything shipped with Secure Boot must have their installer signed by Microsoft or disable UEFI Secure Boot, if they can. UEFI Secure Boot in itself is actually not very much. It is just a simple standard for supporting and enforcing cryptographic verification of loaded images before they can be executed. That's all UEFI Secure Boot is. If you haven't implemented your hardware to have specific support for um, somehow restricting accesses to various bits of, of flash uh, at various points in time and having this entire hardware infrastructure in place and also any sort of pre-UEFI firmware <coughs> running, doing everything correctly, you do not have a secure boot. So I do not like the fact when people start saying secure boot without the capital letters when what they're talking about is UEFI secure boot. It is effectively a product name, uh, a trademark, whatever, only it isn't. Um, so my ridiculous example was that if you had an obnoxious friend who had a red pet lizard and named it green, um, this is not a descriptive term, uh, it is a name. Um, and I'm actually going to pretty much ignore everything about UEFI Secure Boot uh, for the rest of this presentation because there is too much focus on it and in itself it is not a bad thing. UEFI, on the other hand, does not mandate the use of Secure Boot. It specifies how it is implemented if you implement it. Uh, it doesn't mandate that when Secure Boot exists, you <coughs> must prevent the user from disabling it. It is effectively just an API that lets you do signature verification on applications to run under UEFI in a standardized way. So hating UEFI because of Secure Boot, you should also hate Linux because you can run Flash on it. The shim was kind of, at least the commercial Linux distribution's way of dealing with this fun situation that they now needed their installers signed by Microsoft. Um, so Matthew Garrett threw together something that actually displaces the um, root of trust, or how you would put it, so that you sign the shim, and then the shim keeps its own key database, and you can add and remove keys as you wish, hundreds and billions of them if you feel like, um, and that kind of helps the situation. Um, just to be clear, that because it is actually even though it's Microsoft, it is actually a CA, so they're not going to sign off on something that just goes, oh, and by the way, I'm not going to continue anything I load after me. Um, all of the commercial distros today carry an out-of-tree patch for Grub in order to deal with this. This is not optimal. So, what's UEFI? UEFI is something almost unique in the history of mankind, because I'm ignoring open firmware. It's a specification for a firmware architecture that has actually gained, to some extent, critical mass uh, out in the commercial community. It's already the de facto standard for x86 machines. Um, in fact, you're starting to see x86 machines go out without any BIOS compatibility mode. Um, but more importantly, UEFI is only the specification. The implementation is a completely separate thing, and any UEFI buyers out there 
may share as much or as little code as, as humanly possible between each other. The origin of UEFI was EFI, the extensible firmware interface developed by Intel slash HP for the IA64 infrastructure architecture. Um, and at some point, I forget, 2003-ish, um, version 1.10 was handed over to the newly created UEFI forum to help drive this as an open-ish specification. So why did this happen? It happened because reality before UEFI was BIOS. And you have to really hate something before you start saying that it is worse than BIOS. Um, it was a horrible, outdated piece of crud tied to an architecture that hasn't really existed since the 70s. Um, secret sauce piece of software that's reverse engineered out of the original IBM PC by a few companies that somehow had managed to find ways patent-wise to not be sued out of oblivion by the others. Um, probably by mutually assured destruction. Um, and, you know, the PC platform hung on to this for as long as humanly possible because the PC platform has always had you know, it's, it's backwards compatibility has always been a big thing. So actually the move to UEFI was kind of a huge step for, for the PC. Um, and you simply got to the place where BIOS could no longer be extended to have more pretended disks in the hard drives that they were pretending had X cylinders and everything that just wasn't the case anymore. And the other thing to remember is that, you know, it's an entirely closed world run by a very small group of companies. There was no feedback, there was no way to really affect anything about what the BIOS did unless you were the one paying um, and actually building the hardware and paying the BIOS manufacturers for it. So UEFI is nice and shiny and brilliant. Well, no. But it's about 20 years less legacy um, than BIOS. It was initially developed for Intel uh, for i64. It is actually one of the cleanest and most useful firmware infrastructures I have come across. That's not to say that it's clean. I'm saying that firmware has a tendency to be kind of horrid. Um, and, and UEFI is certainly no more horrid than, than average. So the other thing to be aware of is that I said UEFI is just a specification. Uh, the implementation is a combination of what was released by Intel as a set of, of software called EDK2 for ED EFI Development Kit 2. Um, and that was set up as a project on SourceForge uh, called Tiano Corp. Um, and Tiano Core is the project that does the EDK2 development. It's a, a fairly active project, I would say. I mean, not Linux kernel-wise, obviously, but you know, there's certainly 10-ish emails on a slow day. Um, and contributors are both hardware, BIOS, and software vendors. Um, but if you actually go out and buy a PC with the UEFI BIOS in it, um, that will actually be augmented with additional bits from that the BIOS vendors still add on to the base Tiano core. So what do I like about UEFI? <coughs> it provides a standardized execution environment into which any bootloader, device driver, or boot time configuration utility can be installed and execute. Um, the execution environment provides things like direct block access support, direct Ethernet support, console support, portable across any implementation. In theory, and in very few instances, that's not actually the case. File system support. It supports GUID partition tables. MBRs are about as valid in the common day as, as the BIOS is. Um, so that just has to go. It mandates VFAT support, 
but in a sort of, I don't know, making it slightly less bad, um, Microsoft have explicitly released their VFAT driver with explicit patent grants and stuff so that no one will be sued for actually using VFAT in UEFI. And support for additional file systems can be added by loading drivers into this cute and, and, and standardized um, API environment. It's extensible. That's the, the E in the UEFI, Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. Uh, it supports running applications and loading device drivers and protocols. So expansion cards can have drivers installed into the EFI system and lo loaded automatically on boot, um, which is actually really handy. It's also slightly kinky, but um, it has versioned APIs, uh, so it is kind of throughout designed so that if we were to increase the add some fields to this structure in the future, then you still have the structure size and all of the old fields are in the same places. So it's it's nice and, and compatible like that. It has an architecture independent bytecode format called EBC, EFI bytecode, which is actually quite cute, but I haven't actually seen anyone using it. It would be quite handy if someone did though. Because, again, in theory, then you could have your device driver as a platform-independent bytecode thing on an option ROM on your expansion card. But no one's doing that. Runtime services tend to be a slightly sensitive topic, at least in the ARM community. Um, they are somewhat horrific from a system design point of view. Um, I kind of tend to look at it like you're giving the kernel a shared library which you're calling into at runtime. Um, it's a bit clunky that way, but it does give you a very nice level of integration between the firmware and the operating system. So the operating system can set environment variables for the firmware such that on the next boot, uh, I want you to load this image after this timeout um, and whatnot. In Linux, there is a simple utility which is called EFI Boot Manager, which operates on, on files in, in slash sys to, to make this magically happen. It also supports things like um, capsules, which is effectively something you package up and pass to UEFI to do something clever with on the next reboot. And that can, for example, be you know, a, a standardized way of doing a firmware upgrade on reboot. And a standardized interface for system reboot and power off, which is also kind of handy. Secure boot is a good thing. Seriously. If the device owner is in control of the mechanism, there is absolutely nothing negative about the fact that you can verify that your system is booting from the first instruction it's executing exactly what you think it's booting. This is a good thing. It has a written specification. Some people make light of this, some think it's completely irrelevant. Um, it actually makes people think about what they're doing. I, I had a bit of a rant at the Debian conference in November because the day before I did this presentation I found that the grub on top of U-boot port had stopped working because during the transition to be able to build U-boot with Clang they had redefined the register that you would use for its global data pointer and hence needs to be preserved on every switch between grub and, and calls into u -boot, um, they were going to use R9 instead of R8. That's a hard ABI breakage. That doesn't tend to happen if you have a specification you're working to. It also has a conformance test suite. Um, may not be perfect, but even having one is pretty good. So you have all of these different implementations of UEFI. Some people patch various bits, some people patch other bits, and they add their other stuff on top. There is a conformance test suite which they at least can run to see that they haven't completely broken everything. 
It's kind of critical mass. Um, it's, it's known to work over at least four different architectures, if you count the two ARM ones. Um, handy if you want to slot seamlessly into the whatever is called this weak scale server ecosystem, which um, ARM is trying to do. So that's also a good thing. So what's less good? The specification is behind a registration wall. I think this is somewhat overzealous. Um, however, you don't actually need to sign any contracts. The only thing you need to do in order to get to the specification is fill in some details and name and <laughs> acknowledge that you're not permitted to implement a UEFI, um, imp create a UEFI implementation unless you go and, and sign one of their agreements. But that said, signing the agreement to become a UEFI adopter doesn't cost anything, and you can do it either as an organization or an individual. So, yes, from a free software point of view, it's not ideal, but BIOS. <laughs> you get core boat shipping on servers, I'll port Grub to run on it. <laughs> not an arm, it's not. Um, source code. It's not exactly without legacy. Um, drivers and acceptables are P cough. I'm serious, they're P cough. Um, I don't like camel case, but it really looks like that. And it's Windows coding style, so it's DOS line endings on everything. Apart from shell scripts, because shell scripts don't work with DOS line endings, so not those, but everything else is DOS <laughs> line endings. The repository is Subversion. Hey, it's not CVS. Um, <laughs> but there are official Git mirrors. Um, but you do get interesting things when you work with the Git mirrors, and, and you don't get end up having different hashes even though you technically have the same commit. Um, so it's okay-ish. All text support is UCS2. Not UTF. Sorry? No, 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 but the, all the text support handling in, in UEFI as well. No, UCS2. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because Microsoft. <laughs> Test Suite has historically only been available to, well, I say licensees, that's the wrong word, the members. And they used to be listed as a zip file. We've made one huge progress in that it is now a Git repository. But it is a restricted access Git repository. However, there are at least discussions about maybe we could open source it. Um, the, the current kickback tends to be, why? Um, I'm hoping we can provide some, some good feedback on that. We have, um, I know for example, they're starting to look at using Linux a bit more proactively to actually verify things like the runtime services. Um, I think Canonical have a firmware test suite or something like that that they're starting to look at, and I think Hopefully, in time, if we show them that it's actually really useful to have a test suite open, then maybe they can be convinced. But for now, it stays um, members only. Again, membership doesn't cost anything. It's just a snag. In case you didn't believe me about the code, I decided to cut and paste some by random. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> The other thing is that EDK2 contains no platform support. No means that almost no platform support. Um, partly because it's BSD license, people don't have to feed back their drivers. Partly because just the ecosystem all of this comes from is extremely close, so people haven't actually, I think even, gotten used to the concept of it being possible to do. 
Um, so effectively, the amount of platform support you have inside Tiano Core UDK2 is um, support for running on a QEMU um, virtual machine and, and that level of platform support, but no actual full uh, hardware platform support. And a few final comments that I couldn't find a good header for. So I said I work in Lunaro, and at least for a few ARM platforms, we have platform support available in our own Git tree. Um, mainly for members, but we've been fairly clear from the start that we think you know, open source platform support for EDK2 is a good thing. So if anyone else comes to us with a platform they would like us to take into our tree, we would be um, quite pleased to have a look at that. Um, if you want to have a look at what the Linaro thing looks like um, without, with some platform support, um, it's there. Or, well, it will be there in a few days' time, but it has been there. Um, and we have the various member companies in Linaro. The, the core members get to have landing teams that kind of help out and maintain and make sure that their platforms are actually working. Um, so we do a, a re release once a month of whatever the current state of the tree is. Um, and we also do various bit of peripheral development for the ARM architectures. Um, so things like Grub, things like the UEFI runtime services support in Linux, um, things like the kernel UEFI stub, which is we actually make the Linux kernel have a small UEFI bootloader prepended to it. So you just execute it from, from within UEFI. Um, and yes, ACPI comes in there slightly at the end. Um, but again, it's really just a mechanism for communicating data into the kernel um, that's there to use for device tree as well. And frankly, until this month's release, uh, well, January release, we had no platform that could be booted using only ACPI tables in that tree, and we had several that can be booted using only device tree. Uh, oh crap, I forgot to change the dates. Um, as of a couple of months ago, the UEFI forum is now the owner of the ACPI specification as well, which means they've started up an ACPI specification <coughs> working group. Um, I have heard some negative comments about this, saying that ACPI was such a brilliant and open standard, and why, is, why are we going to hide it in, in the UEFI forum? You think people who think that ACPI is a brilliant and open standard haven't really read the licensing requirements for ACPI, um, but they did have their documents out in public without registration, so that's something. However, the other thing ACPI did was it kicked off a year before the next window release, and when Windows release happened, ACPI went away until the next Windows release. Um, now we actually have one place with an organization that is continuously looking at ACPI and extending, improving, modifying it. And a um, few bits and pieces, um, instructions for building and running UEFI on the ARM 64-bit models. Um, UEFI forum itself is available there, and they have a white paper they wrote specifically to try and counter the the bad press they'd managed to acquire in the open source community. Um, it's actually not that bad a paper. It just would have been a lot better if they had released that 18 months before they did. And that's all I have slides for. So I kind of breeze through that, but yeah. Thank you. We'll we'll take some questions. I have a microphone, which will be very helpful with the full room. I had so right here. Do my best, Oprah. 
so just to get uh, for historical correctness, um, I've read a long time ago that uh, originally the Microsoft requirements would also force on x86 to disable, uh, to make it not possible to disable Secure Boot, but that was done by industry pressure. They uh, limited their actions down there a bit and said, okay, on x86 you are now allowed to disable it, but on ARM uh, for sure never ever. It's, w what's the correct history there? The correct history is twofold. One, Microsoft have managed to get out of a few quite substantial um, antitrust lawsuits by promising never ever ever to do really bad things again in the PC space. And on the other hand, I mean, th they didn't say, that that's, that, that's the other thing which I also used to get wrong, they didn't say ARM devices, they said Windows RT devices. If there was to exist Windows Server for ARM, then they would have to actively change their wording in order for that to be the case. All right. So. I, I have almost a few questions to each slide that you had. Um, if you want to sap through them really quickly, I'll 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 run. Uh, my my, my, my train leaves at seven. Yeah 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 no we'll you'll you'll catch the train don't worry. Next. Also next. Yes, so WIFI is not ACPI. Um, actually, because WIFI now manages ACPI, WIFI is sort of ACPI, or, well, yes. Um. UEFI Forum owns the ACPI specification. Exactly. All right, next. And then I'll go to the next one. Um, logo requirements. I do agree, so, okay. I do agree that verified boot or validated boot or some way to control your own machine, what it does boot is a good thing. The problem with the UEFI isn't so much the UEFI forum, it is the fact that each and every instance of a UEFI BIOS that we will see in the marketplace will be according to the, the Microsoft uh, requirements because people, uh, the, the companies that sell machines, they, they sell Windows machines. They don't sell PCs that might also be able to run Linux. They sell Windows machines. So it's all fine and good that the EDK is, is um, so without all of the platform support, which is what the BIOS vendors still um, get their salaries from. It's all fine that the, the EDK is open source, but it's not, I don't know. It doesn't solve the problem that every single UEFI um, deliverable or, or instance in the marketplace will be a closed source product. It also wouldn't have solved the problem. It also wouldn't have solved the problem if the UEFI forum hadn't written this piece of specification and Microsoft had laid down on people. Here is what you're going to put into your UEFI. Then you would have had something that a would have done exactly at least the same thing, and B, it wouldn't even have been written in a way that was somehow controlled by input from multiple parties. I agree with you that the product thing is an issue, but... Well, it is if you decide to go and buy hardware that does thing that you do not want that hardware to do. So we Already, so most of the work is already done, but it's, it's difficult for 
largely a community uh, project so far. Well, although industry is industry interest important to picking up utilities for engineers and so on. Um, we have a few more questions we can get to. If we could, when you state a question, please for you to summarize it and let the speaker um, respond. Thanks. That, that was a bit long. <laughs> no, but it, seriously, I do have a train to catch, but drop me an email. It's firstname.lastname at lenardo.org. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, are there any like x86 manufacturers who have been good citizens uh, and feeding back to Tianocore? Or there, there, there is a lot of feedback actually going into Tianocore. Um, it doesn't tend to be platform support, so you don't tend to get the device drivers. But you do get people who go, okay, this would be more efficient to do this way and put into the sort of the core things like memory management or just helping with bug fixes and so on. Because that much they have realized that open source helps them to have to do less work. Any good ones? Uh, most of them, um, to be honest. I mean, even, uh, certainly even some of the bias vendors. Are the drivers as good as those in the kernel? They're not drivers. That's, that's what I said. There's no platform code. It's, it's the, the core functionality, APIs, memory management, resource allocation, protocols, and that bit. They don't tend to publish the drivers. Uh, if for packaging, if you wanted to build a complete system package which would include um, the UFI bootloader, would you then have to sign the members' agreement, or could you just get the source and build it? Um, no, you could just get the source and build it. I'm pretty sure. I'm not a lawyer. But that, that's my um, interpretation. What you couldn't do is go and write your own specification entirely from, your own implementation entirely from scratch, and then do that. And even then, I think the only thing they could prevent you from doing would be calling it UEFI. You, you say the expansion cards could load could, could uh, provide drivers to the UFE platform. If so, how does it work with Secure Boot? Do they have to sign the drivers using Microsoft certificates, or are they free to load anything they want so I can plug in uh, an expansion card and hijack the machine? So, <sighs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. So if, if you have a driver that's actually on an option ROM, I have to confess I don't know how that's being treated. If you have a driver that you're installing, then that would have to be signed. Option ROMs require a CSM, so the, the BIOS compatibility layer in UAP in order to run. Mm, no. If it's, if it's a, a PC style option ROM, but there is an option ROM support for UEFI. That's the CSM, right? No. Okay. So the concept here you present is that UEFI is not bad. And technology is rarely bad in itself. We define, for example, malware to be bad, but when malware is used in um, jailbreak, we define it as good. Yet we define malware as generally bad because the general case it is bad. So, is the general case of UFI secure boat good? I have no objections to UFI secure boot. Well, I have only minor objections to UFI secure boot as long as the device owner can disable it or install uh, and slash or install his own keys which is the case for at least almost all x86 UEFI platforms out there today. Um, that's why I said I had some reservations, because that's not a good thing. Um, a, short qu a short question to um, 
so you, you said for ARM tablets, for Windows RT tablets, and etc. Blah blah blah. How is how is the current state in the industry uh, when when we look at other devices like mobile phones and etc. Are they all building their own bootloaders at this moment, and could they also switch to a UFI boot for you know Android phones and etc. So that we get a little bit of standardization in there. There's no reason why they couldn't. Other well, than Google obviously they tend not to. Well, Google obviously, but. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, U-Boot is frequently used. Um, Google used Tiny Kernel or something, uh, I think someone told me. Um, there are various boot options out there. Um, there are several boot options out there. And the embedded space and the non-embedded space have yet to agree on much anything. But is there actively work being done from UEFI side to get into that market? or? Not so much. I mean, ARM has obviously an interest in keeping as much standardization as is possible, um, but we can't really go and, and twist people's arms. <laughs> but why not? <laughs> so, in your opinion, um, speaking, uh, seeing it from a broad perspective, is WEFI a threat? to free software in general? I don't think it is. Um, it's also not necessarily an assistance. I mean, certainly, if you're into core boot, UEFI maybe is your enemy, right? Uh, at least a competitor. Um, so I see nothing in UEFI as such or you know, within the UEFI forum that seems to be in any way talking about we want to lock down devices. It's all about standardization and reducing the ridiculous um, validation and verification burden the hardware manufacturers would have if they don't standardize on something. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, we have yeah. Do you hope that this will avoid the issues currently with, say, U-Boot, where you get a lot of different vendor versions and you can't really guarantee what you're going to find on whatever development board you get? Yes. <laughs> that, that's what I'm hoping. I mean, it's U-Boot is absolutely fine if you're shipping a set of images for one device and you know how each of them integrate with each other. That works absolutely fine, there's no issue with that. But trying to create a general purpose operating system installer, trying to create an installer CD, an installer USB image for U-Boot, they say they're working towards that. If they do, I'll be happy to use it. They are very far away from that. Indeed. I'm, I'm with you. I feel your pain. Uh, so I was wondering, would it be considered maybe um, a bit cynical of me to posit that maybe Microsoft's actions with saying, okay, we'll leave x86 alone, we'll only bring in this um, secure boot from Windows RT devices, i.e. ARM, um, that they might be playing a waiting game and have seen that the writing is probably on the wall for x86 and the way everything is going to be going is people are going to be using tablet devices, which hopefully will all be running Windows. So eventually there's going to be this sort of shift in the industry towards Microsoft devices. And so ostensibly it looks like you're not getting locked into a device because, hey, this is only these tablet devices and not the x86 stuff. But down in the fullness of time when all of a sudden all devices are tablet devices running Windows and everyone suddenly finds that they are locked into a jail. How large is Windows RT market share? <laughs> I was going to add that it does look like maybe it hasn't quite panned out that way. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that no one in Microsoft ever thought of such a thing, because blatantly they have. Um, I don't think there's any chance of that actually happening. They would need to actually have market dominance for that to happen, and I don't see that coming. 
Okay then, you get one more. <laughs> so first the front row and then back to you. Well, I, I, it's a quick comment on this. <laughs> yeah, but there's one on everything. <laughs> <laughs> When Windows went from Windows XP to Windows Vista, they started to require signed drivers. And you could disable the drivers at boot, which several free software projects which required a custom driver for, for example, um, Luke's partitions to read them. And those projects, have you seen any you know, decline of those projects in the Windows space after they required, started to require signed drivers? I have seen a decline in the Windows space. Okay. I have slightly seen a decline there because some most part that does not seem to survive that step, to having to inform users to turn off your computer, go into settings, disable driver support for the whole computer, or sign driver support, and then boot up again. You can take that what you want. I'm not sure there's anything I can comment on there. Yes, Microsoft occasionally do shitty things. Yes. I don't know. So my comment on on the question about x86, maybe Microsoft may be throwing x86 to the to the sharks and and sort of betting on Windows RT. My my one concern is that UEFI is uh, supported by Linaro as the the firmware solution for 64-bit ARM platforms, meaning that the servers of the well, future, starting in a couple of months or so, are also going to be UEFI. And while Microsoft don't have any logo requirements for servers yet, it, I, I can't help but have a bit of a strange taste in my mouth. This is very noticeable. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Is it, okay, we still have a couple. One of the reasons I think U-Boot is so popular in ARM is because it comes with a, already a comprehensive set of uh, board support packages and, and drivers for a wide variety of, of different boards. Absolutely. In many cases, the manufacturing can just take a board that's closest to what he has, add maybe a driver, tweak one, and, and he's done. What do you think it would take for a, a similar project to, to be spawned around UEFI and the, uh, the reference um, Possibly implementation? Possibly just critical mass. Possibly just the ARM vendors who've been used to working like that with U-Boot having a go at UEFI and doing the same thing. I mean, that's one of the reasons we've at least told people, look, we have a tree, we will take your platform support if you send it to us, because we want to kind of help enable that. But we can't really also start forcing people to do it. It's quite possible many of the server manufacturers will want to keep dealing with the same business partners they've had in the past, meaning they will be going to the BIOS vendors for their UEFI implementation, and the BIOS vendors are as yet still not very frequent in actually publishing drivers. Just one question out of uh, curiosity. Um, also, historically, uh, because you mentioned that in passing, um, why did Intel come up with EFI and not adopt open firmware, for instance, or something? Uh, was there like a specific advantage to going all the way with e EFI? I didn't work at Intel at the time. Yeah, okay. I I'm guessing not invented here was as important as anything else. Okay, one more question. Do I? Um, so, EFI is a specification. How many? are you able to gauge how many different ways of implementation of that specification there could be? Because I think the devil will be in the detail of the implementation and that's where the nasty stuff can creep in. In reality, I don't think most people would bother. Um, I don't, I'm not expecting to see a from scratch re-implementation of UEFI anytime soon. Um, more likely to see people who take Tianocore and then 
change some bits. Obviously, in order to keep track of that, you'd need to have good test suites. Cool. Without further ado, I think uh, we're done here. Thank you so much for feeling all the questions. Thank you.